This is the Real Estate Investing 365 Podcast, your go-to source for real estate investing strategies so you can start living the life you want and get where you want to go with your host, Justin Hanna. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Another episode of Real Estate Investing 365. Today, I have Andrew Keel with me. Um, he's the owner of Keel Team LLC, where he, he and his team manage uh, 16 now at this point, mobile home communities throughout the Midwest. And uh, he manages them kind of from afar. He lives in uh, the Florida area. So what's up, Andrew? Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm excited to get into this because, uh, you know, it's kind of like, it seems like trends kind of uh, change, obviously, in everything. And, uh, you know, the uh, apartments were really a huge thing or small multifamily when bigger pockets first got started, because that's what everybody was talking about. And then, and then it seemed like, honestly it's like so many people follow bigger pockets that brandon turner got into mobile home parks and now everybody's talking about mobile home parks but you've been doing it for quite a while and you're kind of ahead of the the curve so why don't we uh dive into where you got started where you came from before real estate and then how you even got the idea of real estate and then mobile home parks and all that good stuff Yeah, definitely. So I started out uh, as a sales representative for a branding company here in the Orlando area. And at the same time, I started buying a couple single family rentals. And, you know, they were going fine. They they were slowly building up cash flow when I had extra extra money. Uh, And then I eventually just didn't, you know, I I grew to not love that job anymore, that J-O-B. You know, I was uh, in like a cubicle environment, you know, my office had no windows. So I was just, you know, I would just grew to, to, you know, hate it. And I wanted to do something different. So I started researching uh, real estate. I joined a local RIA and uh, started learning about flipping houses and wholesaling uh, residential contracts. And then I went into that full time. And, you know, it was very inconsistent. You know, I'd have like one flip close one month and I was on cloud nine and then the next three months it would be low and then I'd have another flip close. So it was kind of hit or miss. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I wanted some more stable, you know, monthly monthly income. Uh, So my rental income was always very consistent. So that's that's what I gravitated towards is how can I scale this business? Uh, And then surprisingly enough, I got off I mailed out a bunch of yellow letters and off of one of the yellow letters I mailed to a probate lead they said hey we have two mobile homes that we need to sell up in Ocala Florida and I'm in Orlando Florida so that's like you know an hour or two away so I drove up there and they were like wanting to just get rid of these things fire sale them so I was able to pick up two like 1995 vinyl sided shingle roof mobile homes for twenty two hundred dollars and they had clean titles and everything. So I bought them and I didn't really know what I was going to do with them. So I got on YouTube and I Googled how to make money with mobile homes. And some guy named Lonnie Scruggs uh, popped up and I just became all of his content. Uh, He wrote a book called Deals on Wheels and basically teaches people how to buy mobile homes and then sell them like for payments, for monthly payments, like sell them on contract. Uh, And I... I made a bunch of money on those two homes. Then I ended up scaling it and I did about 19 of those deals over the next couple of years that were you know, just mobile homes that I was selling on contract. And then I met a park owner when I was doing this and the park owner said, hey, you know, the real value, the real wealth is built in the real estate and not in the homes. And I had an aha moment. Uh, you know, he told me a lot about like the depreciation and different things, you know, that, that benefit you through real estate and how you can scale and get leverage with, with bank financing. So I basically like went home from that meeting, wrote on my refrigerator, you know, I want to buy a mobile home park, you know, in 2016 and, you know, I eventually stalled and didn't buy one that year. Yeah. Uh, but I, I went to the boot camp, the Frank and Dave MHU boot camp. I went to a couple other mobile home park specific investing kind of uh, conferences. And, you know, I started cold calling owners of mobile home parks and asking if they would sell. So I later on, June 27, June 2017, uh, I closed on my first park. Uh, it was a deal, it was 67 lots, and it was five states away in Illinois. Uh-huh. And 
actually some of the investors that I got for that deal went to the boot camp that I was at, the MHU boot camp. So I found the deal. I put a little bit of money in it. My investors put in most of the money and we closed on that deal and it ended up being a home run. Uh, I mean, the case study is on my website and we just, we just totally crushed it. So then they were like, Hey, we want to do more deals. We want to, you know, we want to keep going. So yeah. ended up doing five more deals with those investors. And since then I brought on other investors. We've done syndications where investors can invest $50,000 or more. And, you know, we, we've purchased a portfolio back in 2018 of five parks and now we're up to 16, uh, just, just about a thousand lots. And we have two parks under contract right now that, uh, you know, fingers crossed, if all goes well in due diligence, we should close on soon. Wow. That's crazy. So <laughs> we got a lot to unpack there, but that's, so that just gives some context. It feels like just yesterday, I think I mentioned on the, this on the phone that, uh, just yesterday was 2017 and yeah. halfway through to, So June, you close in your very first mobile home park. And now just three years, less than three years later, two and a half years, really two years, eight months, you have a thousand pads. That's crazy. What a, yeah. what a journey. I mean, <laughs> it's, I, w I was lucky enough to where I could go in full time, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, I didn't have an, a day job or anything else that was holding me back. So I was putting in, you know, 50 hour weeks plus into building my mobile home park acquisitions business. Right. So what, I mean, we're going to go back just in a second, but what were you doing during those uh, uh, 50 weeks? Because I think a lot of people, you know, they want to go full-time in real estate and they think they'll have enough work, but they don't really know what that work's going to be until they get in the process. They're like, what am I going to do for all that time? So what exactly would a, a busy week look like before you had a thousand pads? Like, what were you doing? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, first off, I was like managing, I was asset managing the park. So there was an on-site manager. Mm -hmm. I would have meetings with her daily, kind of just checking in on projects because we were bringing in homes. We were rehabbing empty homes and we were doing common area improvements. So there was managing them, you know, the mm -hmm. on-site managers. And then as we added parks, you know, I was the sole asset manager that met with all of them and kind of made sure the, the collections were good. The occupancy projects were, were being worked on. And then I was also, you know, paying the bills, you know, paying the water bills, keeping track, making sure there was no leaks or anything like that. Uh, and then all the while I was, you know, finding new deals, trying to search for the next deal, cold calling, you know, mailing out letters, uh, trying to, you know, grow the business because, you know, really it's, it's a scalable business, but you got to get to a certain number of lots before you can afford to hire someone mm -hmm. to help you with bookkeeping and, you know, hire an admin and so forth. So, uh, it's, it's been a great journey. It's been a lot of fun and, yeah. uh, you know, well, we've, we've built a business. Yeah. And you were in Florida, so you were probably taking lots of trips up to where you buy your mobile home parks back and forth and all that stuff. So yeah, there's a lot to entail, but it's like, oftentimes people don't know, really know, you know, they think it's so easy because you know, when they have one or two rentals, it's like not that difficult, but when you, once you scale and get a whole portfolio, it's like, you don't know what you don't know that you're going to be doing to, to grow the business, you know? So um, exactly. Exactly. And, and, when, and right when you take over one of these mobile home parks, that's like the most crucial time because, you know, you really have to set expectations for the tenants as to how the new management is going to, you know, do things. Are they going to fine you if you put trash on your porch? Are they going to, you know, can you just leave tires all over the place? You know, we have to be very strict at the beginning and, and have, you know, create a schedule like, hey, every month on the 16th, our managers go out and issue violations. And if they're not fixed by the end of the month, then they're going to get fined and that's going to go on their next month's statement. So there's just things like that that we implemented. And then also my wife and I moved on site to several of the projects for the first couple of months after we purchased them so that I could keep my, my hands on everything, all the projects. Because one thing we noticed is that when you're hiring contractors to rehab mobile homes, you're not able to you know, hire like a general contractor like you would be able to in a multi feel you're going to get like, you know, Joe Schmo handyman that, you know, is, is working out of, out of his pickup truck. Right. So it, it was a different environment and, you know, we really had to, uh, we had to make that work and, you know, we just found being on site saved us so much money. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, let's go back a little bit to when you were, um, you were working for that marketing company and you first decided like, 
this job sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you might <laughs> like the job of being in the office and the cubicle and just like, you're obviously entrepreneurial. So working for somebody else and all that didn't really work out. Um, how did you even get the idea to do real estate? Like what did you have family in real estate investing or what was it? I didn't. Um, I just, there was some people like in my, my family's kind of social group that owned real estate and, you know, I just saw them. I saw the freedom that they had. I saw the, you know, the, the financial benefits that they had. And I also read, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it talked about assets over liabilities. So I, you know, I was very in tune with, you know, trying to build cash flow, monthly passive income. And that was really the start of it. Yeah, for sure. And then you, so you went from there and you decided, Hey, I'm going to start doing some wholesaling. So what year was this when you first did, got into the wholesaling and flipping business? That was back in 2000. That was back in 2014. In 14. Okay. So that was a good time in there in Florida and especially I'm yeah. sure Orlando market houses were cheap and easy to come by. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And demand was really strong. So, uh, you know, we, we, we wholesaled a lot, you know, looking back, it would be like, wow, I, I wish I kept some of those properties that I wholesaled, right. you know, and, and did a burr method on them or something. But uh, at this point, you know, we're really focused on just mobile home parks. That's, that's our mm -hmm. bread and butter. When you were doing the wholesaling and the flipping and stuff back then, you know, uh, you went from not really knowing anything about real estate and then you jumped on into that. And within, I'm sure like a year, you got really busy with that business. How were you finding those deals? Did you automatically just start uh, direct mail marketing or cold calling or how were those deals coming across your table? Sure. So I was doing a lot of mailings uh, specifically to divorce, probates, uh, and then like pre foreclosures. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where a lot of ours, our leads came from. Uh, also, I, you know, I was putting out bandit signs and you know, I the was, I was bootstrapping that, it. Yeah. yeah. Normal stuff that, well, I mean, today everybody knows that cause all the podcasts and everything, that's what they all do. Everybody does. But sure. uh, like in 14, it wasn't everybody doing it, I'm sure. So, um, <clears throat> you just had to figure it out what worked and what didn't work. I'm sure. Um, yeah. so, that, yeah, that's awesome. So then you end up buying your first two mobile home parks from a yellow letter that you sent out. Somebody said, Hey, we got to get rid of these things. And you got it for 2200 bucks, which is awesome because it's not hard. I would assume to make a good return <laughs> on $2,200. Right. <laughs> so yeah. you, you bought these exactly. two mobile home yeah, that parks. That was an easy deal or yeah, not mobile home parks. Those are just mobile homes. Yeah. Those are just mobile homes and they were, <clears throat> I mean, you bought them for 2200 bucks and then, you know, cleaned them out a little bit because there was like old furniture and, you know, just just stuff that the people had left in there. Uh, so we cleaned them out, you know, I did like a deep clean on them and then posted them online and sold them for like three grand down and 200 bucks a month for four years. Okay. So this is something people can do right now. They could even target like maybe mailing in mobile home parks, I would imagine, or something like that if they wanted to get into that. They could. You know, there's Lonnie Scruggs videos out there still, and John Fedro, uh, he teaches like a mobile home investing course. Uh, park owners, some park owners don't really like working with investors that are like mobile home investors in their parks because uh, they're always nervous that the homes are going to get, you know, moved out of the park. Uh, but we have worked with quote unquote Lonnie dealers before uh, where we'll give them some of our, our empty park owned homes to have them rehab and sell them because really from when you own the park, you just want lot rent. You know, you, you basically are a big parking lot and you just want to collect rent for having that home on your parking space. Uh, it's just more efficient and you know, less management intensive. So, you know, we, we work with uh, Lonnie dealers. Yeah. It's probably a good idea for, you know, um, the park owner, I guess sometimes it's a good idea. Sometimes it's not, but if you don't have the time or you got a lot of, um, lots, then, um, if you have, you know, run down units, I'm sure it's kind of like, um, it's like a, you're hiring a disposition company to come in and Hey, you know, you just, if as long as you get this thing rented to somebody and don't move the trailer out, I don't care what you do with it. Just make some, fix it up, make, sell it, make get some it. money. Yeah. And you want the park to look good because obviously it'll appraise for more. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can tell the Lonnie dealer, Hey, you know, we require new skirting on the outside and then you, for you to paint the home and seal the roof and you could do whatever you want on the inside, you know, as long as the new tenant you bring in is background checked, you know, by our, our management. Right. Okay. So these two trailers that you bought the very first two, they were in a mobile home park. 
They were, yes. Okay. And then is there some like, um, let's see, like intricacies or whatever you would call it with mobile homes that's different from regular houses as far as, aren't they registered at DMV as well as, or something? Correct. I don't, I don't really yeah. know anything about it. So is there some interesting yeah. thing with this? Yeah, it's it's a little bit easier of a process. Uh, you know, it's just there's a title, just like a car has a title. So when you transfer the title, it's just like you transfer the title to a car. You know, you you sign it, and some states require, like Ohio, requires you to get your signature notarized for the buyer and the seller. Uh, but some states, like Indiana, do not. You just need a signature on the back of the title, and you know the mobile home transfers with that single document. So uh, it's it's easier to purchase these things. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like the one we bought in that park, you know, we paid lot rent on them, you know, which was cheap. I think it was like 200 bucks a month for a couple months until we found the right buyer that had the money to buy them. And then after that buyer bought the homes, they started paying the lot rent plus the home payments to us. Okay. So you owner finance those to them? Correct. Okay. So is there, is there financing, um, companies out there that'll give you like a mortgage on a mobile home or, um, I guess it probably has to be a certain standard or whatever, right? There are. Yeah. Like 21st mortgage. That's a Berkshire company, uh, owned by Warren Buffett. They, they will finance used mobile homes and also new mobile homes that are, you know, built from the factory. So, and there's other, there's, there's other banks out there as well that'll, that'll loan on them. Uh, Right now, they're not as favorable as of terms like a local bank would. Sure, uh, but there are there are some options. And then for mobile home park financing, isn't it some? Didn't something just pass to where Fannie and Freddie is now lending on mobile home parks or something like that? So they're they're loaning they're loaning on acquisitions of the whole park and refinances of a whole park, uh, but they're also in the beginning stages of testing the market to loan on individual manufactured homes. Mm. So that would be huge because, you know, theoretically the price of manufactured homes would go up where they've always been a quote unquote depreciating asset. They would go up because now they're worth more because there's better financing available. So it's something that mobile home park owners across the country are very excited about. Manufactured homes are different than mobile mobile homes though, right? So do you put manufactured homes in your mobile home parks? So manufactured homes, mobile homes, pretty pretty much the same thing. Okay. You know, trailer homes, people can call them that. But uh, you know, back in the back in the sixties and seventies, you know, when, when these things were being built, they were building them more so like a, a travel trailer. You know, there was like a twelve wide trailer. Uh today's day and age, there's, you know, there's extensive, you know, double wides and triple wide mobile homes or manufactured homes. Uh, but you can put like a 16 wide, you know, home. I think the main difference is the, the foundation, you know, on like a manufactured or mobile home. But uh, truly, I think it's really just the the verbiage that's the difference it, you okay know, manuf manufactured if i'm talking to a banker i usually use manufactured yeah uh, but if i'm talking to you know my friends and family i say mobile home park uh because that's what's most commonly known uh but manufactured i guess sounds a little a little more professional sure more fancy. yeah yeah well, i was thinking of manufactured as far as uh you know they have homes that they'll kind of bring in that are um, pre-designed houses and they're all kind of like a puzzle piece. You could bring them in and they put sure. them together. They don't have tires on them or anything. They still can have like a concrete perimeter foundation. But um, out here in California, I think that's what we call manufactured homes is ones that are like prefabbed and they bring them in. Prefabbed. Yeah. 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 And, and I think, you know, technically cause they're manufactured, like if they have a frame, like, you know, like that they can be moved with a truck. Uh -huh. uh, I think that's, you know, that's a manufactured or mobile home as well. But I think manufactured, if it was built in a factory and, you know, set of, instead of a site yeah. built, sure. same thing. Okay, cool. So you buy these two, pro these two mobile homes and you're like, man, this is cool. Like you can make a good, great return. You can, it's not a ton of paperwork process or whatever. And so you end up, uh, keep doing these, you grow that business as, aside from the flipping and wholesaling residential houses. And then you finally come across like a mobile phone, mobile home park owner. And he's like, Hey, why don't you actually get into buying the park? So 
um, you get in and you buy your first park, which was in, what'd you say? In, it, it was in Edwardsville, Illinois. Edwardsville, Illinois. Okay. So how did you go from like, you know, obviously you started looking and looking up mobile home park owners and you were direct cold calling them, direct mailing them, whatever you're doing. Um, did you just go throughout the whole Midwest or did you target a certain area? How did you identify the area you were going to start searching in? Sure. So I went to the MHU boot camp with Frank Rolf and Dave Reynolds. Mm -hmm. And in the boot camp, they teach you that, you know, the heartland, the, the middle of the United States it's is, is a, a good place to buy because you can get the best deals because the cost of land is low. And then also it's far away, from, you know, the coastal states where hurricanes, you know, commonly come and go. Mm. So I figured I'd start there. I went to school up in the Midwest. My family's all from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So, uh, you know, I, I just started there. I figured, Hey, this would be a, a great place to dive in, you know, find some, some 10 cap properties and, that's what I did. I, I just started calling, you know, around several different metros and St. Louis was one of those metros and Edwardsville is just, you know, 15 minutes outside of St. Louis. And, uh, it, it ended up being a, a really great deal for us. Okay. So what, where do you go to find lists of, um, mobile home parks? Is there like specific sites other than like title companies or the land assessor's office or whatever? Yeah, you know, there's like list source. You can hire a VA to go through and, and find them. Uh, there's also, you could just Google hey, mobile home parks in Omaha, Nebraska, and just start cold calling the numbers. And you'd be surprised how many of those phone numbers go right to the owner's cell phone. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah I would imagine, huh? Because a lot of them are probably smaller. So what is like the size that you, I mean, I'm sure now you could take on like a 500 pad place or something and it wouldn't be a big deal. But when you first got started, what was the size park you were kind of um, looking for? Yeah. So when I first started, I was looking for 50 or more lots mm -hmm. and that still holds true today. Uh, we just find it tough to be able to afford, you know, an on-site manager uh, at anything less than that. Uh, but yeah, usually 50 lots or higher is, is what we, we shoot for. And that first park in Edwardsville that had 67 lots. So it was a, it was a good size property. Okay. So you're, you're out there, you're just calling leads. It took you a year and a half to close on that first one from the time you kind of decided to, um, get into it. Now during that year and a half, did you have other ones that came across your table that you wanted to pull the trigger on, but you were just like timid about, or you just, you just, for whatever reason, didn't close on them? Yeah, actually, the, the whole way I found the one in Edwardsville is I was calling comps to try to get lot rent comps around a property uh, in Arkansas. It was in Mountain Home, Arkansas. And funny story, we just closed on that property about four months ago, uh, but it just took a couple years for the sellers to get ready and get comfortable. And, and But I was, I was originally looking at that deal to be my first acquisition, and I was calling around to try to get some comparables. And one of the park managers said, hey, I don't think they want to sell this one, uh, but they might be interested in selling the one up in Illinois. They've talked about that. So I ended up getting a hold of the seller and, and the rest is history. Okay. So you can, your comp area is obviously much larger. Like how? Well, the, the property in, in Mountain Home, Arkansas, I was calling mobile home parks around that property. So it, oh, was, it was all within like 50 miles of Mountain Home, Arkansas. And I, the, the park that I called was just over the border in Missouri. Uh, Mountain Home's like right on the Arkansas-Missouri border there. Mm -hmm. So I called one in Missouri, and that's who forwarded me up to the uh, the Edwardsville opportunity. Okay, yeah, I was, that was a not smart of me. I was thinking you were like, you were calling for comps, and then you called all the way to Arkansas for a comp in Illinois. I was like, I think they're pretty far apart. My geography's not the best, <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, yeah no, we, we'd want them to be close for sure. Okay. All right, cool. So you end up finding this park. What was, what are some of the things you look for in the park that like makes it a good deal or a bad deal? Cause it's like, I mean, you could just call them and everybody will probably sell you for the right price. But, um, are you looking sure. at like cap rate or like, uh, what type of value add stuff is there? What do you look for to makes the park like ideal to buy? Yeah, good question. So the first thing is the utility infrastructure. Uh, a lot of properties have private utilities and we own properties that have wells and septics, but there's also properties out there that have lagoon, you know, sewage systems or wastewater treatment plants. 
And those systems are more complex. They're more expensive to run and maintain. So we don't need any of those properties. I've been having a property with a well. You know, there's EPA requirements. You got to have somebody out there, you know, twice a week to check on it. And then you have to have, to have, some, you have, to have someone daily go check the chlorine levels. So there's just more involved with those. Uh, I prefer, you know, city water, city sewer properties. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just less risk. There's lower, you know, expense because of the, the additional maintenance. So that's the first thing I would check out. Uh, and then also you're, you're going to want to see like the average age of the homes. You know, if you have a park that's all like 1960s model homes, you know, they're going to phase out and, and eventually, you know, you're not going to have any homes in your park because they're all, you know, obsolete. Uh, so you want to look at stuff like that. You want to look at the road infrastructure, you know, the, the big ticket items that are going to be expensive to maintain long term. Yeah, for sure. Okay. No, that makes sense. And what kind of things do you look at to improve, to add value? Just like, you know, apartment complex, you can go in and update the interiors and, uh, you know, paint the outside, put in a little park or something, and that'll raise the cash flow and in, in turn raise the value of the property. Is it the same exact thing really with the mobile home parks? Same, same exact, you know, these, these are all valued based off of the income they produce. Mm -hmm. So the more income, you know, the, the higher the valuation is. So we do things like billing back for, you know, water sewer charges. Uh, we do things like bringing in homes to fill vacant lots, uh, raising rents up to market. You know, a lot of properties, you know, they may be charging a hundred, $150 less than the market is all the home, all the mobile home parks around them are charging way more, but this is a mom and pop owner that have owned it for a long time. They own it free and clear. They have no incentive to increase the lot rents and stir up a craze amongst the tenants. So they just keep maintaining and they, you know, they're still clearing a, you know, a pretty penny every month. So, uh, you know, increasing lot rents, uh, in addition to, you know, getting good management involved, uh, you know, to improve the, the look of the property that all, you know, helps uh, get better quality tenants and so forth. Okay. What about if you come into a park and like the majority of the units are, or the mobile homes are owned by the current park owner? Is that like a good thing or a bad thing or it doesn't really matter? So from, from my business model, we don't want to own the homes. So we prefer to not buy properties that have like 25% or more park owned homes. We prefer parks that have, you know, a fewer number. Uh, but there's some operators out there that I know that they have a different model. They have more of a flat apartment complex model where they want to own all the homes and charge that higher rent. Uh, my thoughts on that are that, you know, mobile homes, manufactured homes, they're built differently. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to be able to get a mobile home faucet at, you know, Home Depot. You're, you know, the, the drywall is a different size. The doors are different sizes. So if you really want to be in the straight rental market, you need to have a good mobile home supply store nearby and that, you know, like a door or a window for a mobile home is also very expensive because they're not just readily available. So the maintenance on those type of assets are extensive and your expense ratio will be higher. So we prefer to, you know, let our tenants own the homes. And like I said in the beginning, we just want to be a big parking lot and collect lot rent. Yeah, for sure. No, that makes sense. Um, cause I'm, I assume there's probably not mobile home repair or, you know, there's not mobile home lows out there all over the place. So, I mean, what, what do you do? You can't like, how many of those are there? Can you order them online or how's that work? You can order them online. There's, there's different, you know, facilities and there is a, a mobile home part store that is pretty, you know, it's in the, the big Midwest cities. Uh, and I think it's even in the Southeast as well. I, I know we have one down in Ocala, Florida here. Uh, but again, things are more expensive and it's just, it's, it's just another hurdle that you're going to have to overcome, you know, with that business model that we prefer to, you know, avoid and, and just collect lot rent. Okay. Yeah. Right on. So, um, you go into a park, you buy a park and let's say there's, you know, it's 50 pads and, um, you, you know, eight of them are park owned the, the, as far as the, the mobile homes. And then some of the mobile homes are 1960s models. And then a lot of them are newer. Will there be a big mix of that or will they mostly all be the same age or, um, what about that? It really depends. Uh -huh. You know, every, every park's a little different. Uh, but typically when these were built, there was some really good financing available 
for mom and pops to go out and develop one of these properties through, I'm uh, pretty sure it was housing and urban development that had like a 97% LTV loan option where people could oh, wow. build these manufactured housing communities. So, you know, depending on what year they built the, the manufactured home property, the mobile home park, uh, you know, you'll get a lot of homes from that era, you know, from some of the manufacturers that were operating at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we typically, our, our preferred, you know, model would have a pitched roof, which is predominantly homes that were produced during the 1980s. Prior to that, you'll see more of a rounded roof or a flat roof. And those just, you know, they, they have more water intrusion and, and more maintenance issues. So uh, that's ballpark of what we look for. Yeah. So as the, mo- as the mobile homes or the manufactured homes end up getting older, um, does it slowly, they start turning out? Like if somebody buys a mobile home and it's just like wearing out, you know, like let's say you buy a park that's has all 19, late 1970s um, homes. Um, in the next 10 or 20 years, those are going to be like 60s homes, you know, they're, they're like phasing sure. out. So what happens is people like end up, I mean, they own it. So do they, they just keep it maintained or they have to move it out and buy a new one or how's that work? Yeah. So it really depends obviously, but some people will rehab their units and, you know, a lot of our, our tenant base is very handy, you mm-hmm. know, and they're, they're more contractor like, so they do a lot of, you know, home improvement stuff. And when their lot rent is $300 a month, you know, they're saving several hundred dollars a month compared to an apartment complex. So they have additional funds that they can reinvest into their home to, you know, make it more comfortable. So some people will rehab them. Some people, you know, will opt to sell it and, you know, upgrade to a, to a nicer unit in the park or in another park. Um, you know, it really just depends on the the tenant and, and the class of tenant. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then, um, you had also mentioned that on the phone anyways, that I think you guys ended up having a mobile home transporting company because you're like, you're like, man, we got all these mobile homes and stuff needs to happen. You're updating them and things. How did that kind of come about? Yeah. So we noticed early on that it was very difficult for us to find good, reliable third party mobile home transporters that could move homes for us as quickly as we needed them to. Mm -hmm. You know, we would make phone calls to every mobile home transporter within, you know, really like 200 miles of a new property that we purchased and none of them would answer the phone. So we'd leave voicemails and then maybe three to, you know, three days to a week later, you know, one or two of them would call us back and then like we would have to negotiate with them and, and, you know, get on their schedule of when they could move our homes, mm-hmm. which is typically they're a month or two out. So with our time frames and our pro formas, you know, it, it, it benefits us to get these, these vacant lots occupied as soon as possible mm-hmm. uh, so that we can push returns and, you know, ultimately increase the NOI. So we, we ended up just starting our own transport company, buying our own toter truck and now our transporter will typically move to a new acquisition and we can find homes and he can go get them and bring them in. And it just makes things, it streamlines that pain point in the infill process for us and just makes it a, makes it a home run. No, that makes total sense. So do you guys contract out to other mobile home park owners too, or is it maybe oh, yeah. you, Oh, you do. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, people, you'd be surprised. People call us all the time you know, just off of a website we have up and, you know, it's, there's extremely high demand for this. Uh, but there's also, you know, a lot of startup costs. There's a barrier to entry with the cost of insurance being very expensive, you know, the, mm-hmm. the toter truck being very expensive. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a unique business model, lots of liability as well. So you got to make sure you have the right person behind the wheel. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, it's like all industries or all asset classes you are in. Like, you know, if you're going to scale something, you want to stay in a a vertical integration model to where like, you know, you get into one asset class and you want to like start other businesses that are centered around that, um, that type of business. You know, if you're a real estate agent, you have a real estate team and then maybe you add on a brokerage department and then a title company and then property management. And it's like vertically integrated. So there's all kinds of unique things I'm sure with mobile home parks that are the same way to where you can add on other businesses that 
work well with your business and then other people will obviously hire you as well. So that's, that's cool. Good job on that one. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, All right. Compliments it well. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's do like kind of a, a scenario to where there's somebody that's brand new and they want to get into mobile home park investing. You know, they've maybe had a couple single family rentals or they haven't done anything before. Um, and let's say they live in California or they don't live in a place where there's any mobile home parks like readily available. I'm sure they're everywhere, but I know here in California, like the property taxes on mobile home parks is like outrageous, um, out here. So I, cause I was looking at a couple of my local area and I was like, I don't even know how you make that work in this, you know, with the cap rates now and what people are selling for and the property taxes are so high. It's like, Oh, it just seems crazy. So how would somebody, what's the first thing they should do? Um, if they're interested in mobile home park investing? I have an interesting approach. I, I think people should go out and do a Lonnie deal first, you know, buy a, buy a mobile home, maybe fix it up a little bit in a park and then sell it on contract, you know, and, and take monthly payments to sell it and mm -hmm. just see how they enjoy that process, you know, see how they enjoy the prospects they're getting and, you know, just, just experience the, the the tenant base and you know the the nuances with renovating a mobile home i think that's going to give you the most hands-on experience you can get as to what it's like to own a mobile home park uh and then you know if that's something you like i would say go to the mhu boot camp with frank and dave uh that's a huge help i mean that covers everything a to z and it's definitely worth the money i've gone actually four times uh, oh, they wow. come to orlando and I go every year because I just, it's, it's really good to network. You know, there's like a hundred people that are in the class and then it's also just very extensive. And I always, I usually bring some, you know, one of our new hires there to help with their, their onboarding and training of, of the industry. Okay. And so you go to that and then I'm sure they'll have you start like identifying an area and then you go out just like you did and you would identify all the mobile home parks in your target market. And then, uh, you think cold calling is the best or do you think, uh, lettering letter, you know, direct mailing is the best, like what's the best Avenue that you see for marketing? I would say cold calling, uh, and letters are both good options. You know, in addition to finding like a local broker mm -hmm. in your target area and just, you know, showing them your intent and they'll also go out and do some marketing to try to stir up some, some leads for you. Uh, so I think those are really, really good options, you know, that, that anybody could start doing right away. And then should, should they look for owner financing deals or, you know, cause I, I've heard that a lot of these people, like you said, own them free and clear. And oftentimes they bought them back in the day, owner financed or had great financing back then. But you know, today financing is a little harder to come by. Do, do you find that owners are more likely to do owner financing than uh, other asset classes? We have a couple that were owner financed, you know, and that's always a benefit. Um, but with how good rates are today at the banks, you know, you can, you can usually get better terms with a bank. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you can negotiate that with the seller and, and, you know, get better than bank terms, either a, a lower down payment or, you know, a lower interest rate or, or something like that, I would definitely encourage it. You know, th these owners do have a lot of equity. So they can be more flexible when they're selling these assets. Mm -hmm, for sure. Okay, cool. And then is there like a specific target cap rate? I'm sure it's different by class of mobile home park, but in general, you know, like, is there a, a cap rate area that you kind of want to shoot for? And uh, yeah. Yeah. We, we try to shoot for a three point spread between our interest rate and our cap rate. Uh, so, you know, that typically puts us around usually an eight cap or higher is what we we shoot for right now okay no that makes sense that way you can still have uh room to leverage that <clears throat> and you know leverage the financing you get and make plenty of uh, return on that so that makes sense so what do you think about like the market where it's at now like everybody a lot of people are coming into mobile home parks but i do know there's you know something like 85 percent of parks are privately owned or something crazy like that right like yeah. where's the market at right now what do, what's your views on that yeah so it's a, I think it's a great time to get into the business. You know, I don't think that it's overrun. I think it, it's getting more difficult to find good deals and the, the deals that are marketed obviously are, are, you know, with Marcus and Millichap and some of the big brokerage firms are, are going for, you know, really high prices. Uh, but I do think that uh, it's a good time to get into the business. Like you said, 
the majority of mobile home parks are owned by private mom and pop type of owners. So there's a lot of those that are like baby boomer generation that own these assets that will start to, you know, uh, sell those off over the next five to 10 years. So it's a great time to, to be in the business. Um, you know, I think that the financing available is, is another benefit that, that makes the returns worthwhile. Uh, but I, I wouldn't underestimate the management that goes into it, even though, you know, it is pitched as a, uh, you know, more passive investment compared to owning a bunch of single family houses. There, there still is a, you know, a hands-on approach that we take and that I think I would recommend anybody take when owning these uh, because, you know, you, you got to make sure that the properties are maintained at a certain level, especially, you know, knowing your, your exit plan, if you're going to refinance or you're going to sell at a certain point, you want to make sure that the property is maintaining or improving that, that grade, that overall grade that it has. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you guys usually have, you always have on-site managers and do they live there or is it like, uh, like how's your management system work? Is there a big company you go out and hire and bring in a manager from them or what's it look like? No, we typically, uh, all, I think all except one of our parks right now has a manager that lives in the park and sometimes we'll hire managers from outside and then offer them free housing and then they'll come and live into the in, live into the park mm -hmm. uh but we have one that is he's also like our maintenance you know guy and he lives just down the street from the property uh but mainly like you know being our eyes and ears is mm -hmm. what the the manager's job is so they need to spend a lot of time in the park and if they live there they're obviously going to you know experience what's going on and that that's that's really key in communication especially when we're managing these assets from thousands of miles away yeah for sure so do you guys uh like give them free rent or whatever and then just pay them a little bit extra or is it totally separate you say hey you still pay your lot rent you still pay whatever you need to pay as a tenant and then we'll pay you a salary for working on the property yeah so we we have them all set up through payroll and typically it's around 10 to 15 bucks per occupied lot per month plus free lot rent, but we do have them pay lot rent and then we reimburse that back to them, you know, through their salary. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's, that's I'm sure there's tons of different ways to work it, you know, but I was just wondering what, what you guys did. Um, and I saw something about, uh, Venmo. You like to use Venmo. Is that true? Um, yeah, Venmo, Venmo has been a good way to, to help, uh, pay, you know, different contractors and things like that, you know, in a, a quick basis, you know, sometimes there's like just random things that come up and we need to, you know, buy a home from someone real quick and, you know, versus running to Walmart and doing like Walmart to Walmart pay, uh, you know, Venmo has come in handy. Okay. I didn't know if you guys use Venmo for accepting, um, you know, lot rent or payments from your tenants or anything. We do not. No, we use a system called PayLease and people can pay either with cash or credit card and they can like go to like a local 7-Eleven or a, a you know a local Walmart, and they can pay their rent there. And it actually registers that you know puts the money right into our bank account, and registers that in our rent manager software that we have. So, PayLease has been a, a really big game changer for us. Okay, no, that makes total sense because you know a lot of people think, oh, I'm gonna <clears throat> automate my payment processing and only take you know. Um, whatever debit cards and it's got to be all online, but you kind of have to work with the demographic that your tenant base is in. So, you know, maybe a lot of them in mobile home parks might not have, um, you know, bank accounts or certain things sure. that'll make it as easy for you to collect your rent. So you need to make it easy for them to get the money to you. Yeah. We'll <laughs> accept anything but cash. Uh, so they can, they can pay cash, you know, through pay lease at like a Seven Eleven or something. Uh, but the on-site managers can all, they can also pay with like a check or money order if they want to pay them direct. So, um, you know, we want to make it easy for people to pay and, you know, people always come up to me and they say, Hey, you know, collections must be hell for you guys. And and I say, it's really not, you know, 95% of our tenants pay on time every month before the fifth, cause we give them until the fifth, you know, like a uh -huh. grace period, 95% pay before the fifth. It's that other 5% that make us work for it. Yeah. Well, yeah. And where else are they going to go? You know, you can't really live in a decent place for much less than usually what most mobile home parks end up costing. Right. So if people want to stay there. They enjoy it. It's a good, um, decent 
community and oftentimes pretty nice for um, less than what a nicer apartment would cost, um, I assume anyways. Yeah, it's very nice. And a lot of people, you know, they don't want to live below someone and keep hearing the booming, you know, from above, or they don't want to, you know, share a wall with someone, you know, it, it also within a mobile home park, you'll have a nice yard, you know, you'll have some space there where you can, you know, let your dog out and things like that. So there are some benefits versus, versus apartments uh, to, to favor manufactured housing. For sure. Okay, cool. Well, where's the Keel team going in the next, you know, five years? Like what's your guys' goal just to keep accumulating more and more parks, obviously, or do you have a number that you're shooting for or change directions? What's your plan? Yeah. So, I mean, we're just going to keep consistently purchasing parks. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say that we're going to, you know, grow exponentially, you know, anytime soon. Uh, we usually buy four to six properties a year and that's a good number for us. We're able to stay on top of that. We're able to manage that efficiently. So that's our plan is just to keep, keep moving forward with that and, uh, and slowly grow and, and add on new properties when it makes sense. Okay. And then I'm sure I, I was going to ask this earlier, but how many people are on your team? Is it just a couple people or is it's probably going to ever expand as, as you get more parks? Sure. Sure. So right now we have an onsite manager at every property. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's 16 and then we have five people out of the corporate office, uh, including myself that, you know, one person is in acquisitions and helps with cold calling and things like that. Uh, you know, we have a full-time bookkeeper, uh, we have an admin assistant, and then we have some help on the operations side. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty efficient bunch. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Cool. And I'm sure as you get more and more properties and your team will slowly, slowly start to grow, but, um, you know, don't really need to stress too much about that until the time comes. So, um, cool. Exactly. Right on. So I think we mentioned it earlier in the show, but what, what is your favorite um, resource to learn about mobile home park investing? You mentioned going to the seminars and things like that, but if there's one thing, what would you choose? If there's one thing I would recommend. Uh, there's a couple podcasts out there. That's probably the easiest and, and definitely the cheapest way to kind of get plugged in. Uh, there's some really good podcasts. Uh, Frank Rolf puts on a mobile home park mastery podcast. That's really good. Uh, Kevin Bupp has a really awesome podcast on mobile home park investing. Uh, and then Jefferson Lilly has another one that's, that's really good. So I would start at the beginning and listen to all of those. And uh, you'd, you'd, you would really get a lot of tremendous info out of those. Cool. Okay. What about a favorite piece of technology or app or software that you use that makes your business a whole lot easier? Yeah, we use Slack. It's a messaging software and that, I mean, just saves us a ton of time. It's, it's very easy and, uh, you know, it keeps track of, of our, our conversations. So it's easy to go back and search, you know, previous question and answer sessions, things like that. Cool. Right on. Well, Andrew, where can people find out more about uh, the Keel team and what you're doing if they want to invest with you or um, just ask you some questions or anything like that? Where can they find out all that info? Sure. Yeah, they can go to my website. It's keelteam.com. That's just K-E-E-L-T-E-A-M.com. If they want to talk about possibly investing in one of our mobile home park acquisitions or they want to talk about maybe doing a, a JV or a partner agreement, you know, to, to purchase a property, or if someone's interested in assigning a mobile home park deal and getting a finder's fee for, for finding a lead on a, on a seller that's, that's motivated to sell their property. Uh, I would love to chat with you. You can go on my website and set up a consult to talk with me directly. Okay, cool. Well, Andrew, thanks. There's tons of all kinds of more information that we could dive into, but obviously everybody's time is limited. So I appreciate what we got here and hopefully people will reach out to you and um, maybe look at mobile home parks as their next asset or their next passive investment with somebody like you, Andrew. So I appreciate everything, man. And you have a great afternoon. Yeah, thank you. You too. All right. Talk to you later.